Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Um, and uh, our particular welcome, of course, to our two special guests this evening. Um, I just need to make first a quick apology. The three of us are completely toxic tonight. <laughs> we have the lurgy, so I think we need to either doing this behind a bit of glass or maybe <laughs> a few of Walter's um, wonderful masks might help as well. Could we please acknowledge in the audience this evening the Stella Walter van Berendonk, who's here with us. <laughs> These guys are completely comfortable speaking about this stuff in front of him. I'm not, so I'm going to be the nervous one here. All right, some first principles out of the way. Um, Chris Dercon, is um, fashion art? No, not at all. Fashion is not art, but it's related to art, mm -hmm. and in many different ways. Uh, first of all, there is a relationship between fashion and art since the beginning of the 20th century, very much so. I mean, surrealism was colonised by fashion, mm -hmm. the way... Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp, and Salvador Dali were abused by fashion is a, is a fascinating thing because the fetish of their work uh, coincided with uh, fashion being a system of fetish. Mm. Um, then there are other relationships. I mean, the relationship today between visual arts and fashion is, is one whereby we um, celebrate celebrities. Um, Again, the fetish, but in art, it's the fetish, fetish of the asset, and uh, which of course uh, has a relationship with fashion. So there are many relationships to be drawn, but uh, first of all, fashion is for me industrial design, mm -hmm. and a very, very important form of biopolitics. We're going to get to all of those points, but um, I'm, I'm just simply insisting, Kat, that you answer yes to that question as, no. some, as someone who is a curator <laughs> of a fashion museum. Unfortunately, <laughs> I do agree. For me, um, fashion is an, is an applied art, and I think um, fashion needs a very different approach than art when it comes to curating. Mm -hmm. And like Chris um, said, throughout the 20th century, there has been a lot of flirting going on between fashion and art. And it goes in waves. Sometimes <coughs> they can't stand each other, and sometimes they have a very intense um, um, relationship. And I think that um, fashion designers and artists do love to collaborate. When you look at Walter's exhibition and when you look at Walter's work, he has numerous collaborations with artists. And that's so interesting that they um, approach each other and, and, and um, try to see how their um, different worlds can work together and, and what the outcome can be of, of art and fashion, bringing it together. But um, when it comes to curating, and I started with that, um, fashion needs a completely different approach because fashion is not made for the museum. Mm. As a fashion museum, we always start from an artificial situation because we exclude the body. And fashion is made for um, bodies. Fashion is not only about the garment. I think that um, is one of the most important things I always keep on repeating. It's not only about the garment. It's also about bodies, body types, yep. uh, about styling, about images. I see designers as creators of images. And if you think of what's going on the past years in, in, in the digital world. It's all about storytelling through images, through <laughs> films in, in fashion, for example. There's this whole new medium of fashion film, which is quite exciting. There's a wonderful fashion film of Walter in collaboration with Nick Knight and um, Simon Foxton in the exhibition. Um, so yes, I think um, fashion and art are different and need different approach. But there is another reason, mm -hmm. uh, Kat and Virginia, why fashion is not really apt to the museum. Mm -hmm. The museum is all about uh, forgetting and remembering. It's about memory. It's a theatre of memory. Mm -hmm. Fashion has nothing to do with memory. Fashion mm -hmm. is always going for the newest of the new. And mm -hmm. fashion is always going about cycles. It's about, you know, alterations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in a way, the museum is saying, I'm not fashionable because I counteract fashion. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting, an interesting aspect. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why we have to come up with new ideas of museums and new yeah. forms of display, how to show fashion, because yeah. we always have to take into account the dictatorship of time and fashion. Mm -hmm. And the museum is a place where that dictatorship of time doesn't count. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So that But makes for an interesting paradox. I love paradoxes and that makes for one. Mm. Absolutely. I think fashion is all about innovation and about the next season. And I think what we can offer fashion designers is the luxury of time. Yes. The luxury to reflect on what they've done um, the, the past 10, 20, 30 years. And when we started the, museums about, uh, the museum about 11 years ago, that was under, under the um, um, direction of Linda Lopa at, at that time, who has been my mentor for, for um, about six years. And her main goal was to create a space with a different sense of time than the time of fashion, a space to reflect, to analyze. And I still think that is a very important goal for MOMU today. But I see a second challenge. I feel that we have to also take into account um, um, new evolutions within the digital world. If you see how um, fast fashion, the fashion world, the fashion business, retail is changing, I believe we can't keep on making exhibitions like we've been doing that the past 10, 20 years. So um, we really have to um, start experimenting with new forms of curating. If not, I even would say that I feel that we risk to lose our relevance. All right. I, I, I want to get to that and about four other points that we've just trailed over um, mm. briefly, but it's, it, that's good. That sets our, our conversation in good directions. But let me pull you back because I, I would hazard a guess that virtually every person in this particular audience this evening would have something in their wardrobe that they have been holding on to for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And even while we all acknowledge that fashion is of the moment, there are things that we absolutely collect, don't we? Mm -hmm. And there are collected items. No, 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 you can't have this one. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping this one. And also items in our wardrobe that we've probably described as a piece of art. Yes? When someone said to you, you know, fabulous hat, well, this is, it's not so much a hat, this is, this is a piece of art, mm -hmm. this one. And uh, that's another paradox to add to it because while I take your point about, you know, fashion isn't made for the museum, that's where a, a devoted interest in it as a design principle will take you. It will take you to those museum principles of collectability and, and what we define as art. Mm -hmm. No? Well, what's interesting about the two examples you're giving is, is the right of the eternal comeback. <laughs> uh, <f> <laughs> We all have that right. <laughs> fashion, fashion, fashion is a comeback kit, <laughs> and many fashion designers are comeback kits. I mean, Walter is a typical example of a comeback kit, uh, <laughs> because he's living these cycles. These cycles are due to financial limitations, to limitations of distribution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, the the collection of a museum is also about you know the comeback, and that's why we keep mm. things because you never know what's going to happen. Now, in fashion, these cycles of coming back are getting shorter and shorter <laughs> and shorter. Mm -hmm. When I was looking at the show of Walter van Berendonk, which <coughs> is put up not chronological, which I think is very, very important, not chronological because fashion today is already into another time mm. uh, philosophy than 15, 20, 30, yeah, 35, yeah. Uh, 35 years ago, then you see that some of the pieces of Walter are, you know, they have been coming back all the time. Mm. And so... That makes it very interesting that in the wardrobe you should keep a piece because you know there will be a comeback. The comeback will be uh, also interesting because you can combine a piece which you kept with <coughs> another accessoire or another mm. color and then it becomes something else because mm. that's the nice thing about fashion. It's also about juxtaposing different kinds of things and it's about collaging and you can collage yourself. For yep. instance, a jeans is going to change immediately if you wear red socks of Walter van Berendonck. I mean, or uh, a, a jacket of Comme des Garçons is going to change when you wear a one Australian dollar scarf of a Tuaregi. Mm -hmm. But you have to get to Timbuktu, which is, which is, which is very difficult. I mean, all these <laughs> things, you know, all these things are, this coming together is, is absolutely fascinating. So mm -hmm. I agree. The comeback is very important. And what was the second thing you said? Well, a piece of art. Yes. I disagree. <laughs> uh, nobody's going to use the term or the sentence, this is a piece of art. When they say that, they mean something else. Mm. They most of the time, then you mean, this is like a fetish for me. Because mm. I was then that person. And I'm looking at the mirror. And I wish that person is still there or that person is going to come back. And a piece of art is something else, which is then you mean also it's so well made. Mm. It's so incredibly well made that even, you know, what repair needed, the tips of these kind of jackets, they always wear out after 10, 
you know, times dry cleaning, and uh, still you want to keep it, even if the tips are completely worn out. It's so well made, it needs repair, it is a fetish, it's not a piece of art. Mm. But it, isn't it also about um, evoking emotions? I think good art and good fashion evoke emotions. It's Which it kind of emotions? It can be all different kind of, of mm -hmm. emotions, both mm -hmm. positive and negative. Mm -hmm. um, and but the difficulty is with fashion is to mm -hmm. maintain that emotion within an exhibition while curating. Yes, mm -hmm. because you, you fashion exhibitions are always static in nature. That was, I think, the most um, difficult thing with Walter's exhibition. Walter's work is all about dynamics, energy, humor, um, passion. It's alive, and then you start with, okay, Walter, what kind of mannequins do you want? And you have these mannequins, and it's not about dynamics. Um, and then Walter said, okay, I want all of the mannequins to turn. And I said, no, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> and in the end, all of them were turning. Um, but there, um, the fashion film helped us a lot, because um, we could there recreate the, the dynamics of, of his work. Um, but I wanted people to come in and feel this, this energy. Um, that was the, the biggest mm. challenge, I think. But it's true what you say. I mean, when you make fashion exhibitions, the whole issue of the mannequin is so important. Yeah. I mean, mm. I remember yeah. when we were working with the Kyoto Costume Institute, which is another very good example mm. of a fashion museum, because what makes them essential is that they consider themselves in the first place as archives, not museums, yeah. which is very important. And they're also archiving, at least in Kyoto, mannequins. I mean, it's, it's so important to have the right mannequin yeah. to show these pieces. Yeah. I mean, uh, the classic uh, mannequins of, uh, you know, the standard, they, they are not fit to mm. show Isimiyaki. You need mm. another form of mannequin. Yeah. So the mannequin is, is absolutely yeah. crucial. And, and I'm a fetishist of mannequins. Yeah. It, would be, it would be, by the way... A, a I'm not the only one, by uh, the way. Marcel yeah. Duchamp was also yeah. a fetishist of mannequins. <laughs> and I think when, when Walter and Dirk mm. did the exhibition mm. design for the surreal, mm -hmm. uh, surrealism exhibition in in Boymans, the mannequin and the fetish for mannequins mm -hmm. uh, by the surrealist was mm -hmm. uh, the starting mm -hmm. point. It was an amazing mm -hmm. uh, exhibition mm -hmm. design. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be, by the way, mm -hmm. be a, a great PhD subject, mm -hmm. mannequins <laughs> and fashion. <laughs> yes. No, because if you look at different designers, some designers even want the mannequin to disappear. If you look like a designer um, like Azadin Alaya, mm. which is all about fashion that clings to the body, which is very sexy, very elegant, very French, yeah. but really underlining the shape of the body. If you loan a garment from him, he doesn't allow you to present it on your mannequin or on a, a tailor's uh, dummy. Mm -hmm. He has these um, perspex, perspex shapes um, custom made for each dress. But it's like the dress is floating, like it's a ghost. The, mm. the body um, disappears completely, and that's a bit paradoxical with the kind of fashion he makes, which is all about the body shape. Revealing that so body it's really shape. interesting mm -hmm. to see um, how designers themselves present their um, um, fashion on mannequins. The best is, of course, to, to make sure that when you do a fashion show, that some of your staff, like uh, you know those who are specialists in visitor experience, are dressed uh, by mm -hmm. the same fashions you show. I, mm -hmm. I remember my first exhibition I ever did in 1985, which was an exhibition about uh, Teatro Mundi, the world of the theater, I had all the guards dressed up by Comte des Garçons, which was then quite mm. easy because Comte des Garçons was still quite unknown in 1985, and it was fantastic. Mm. Suddenly, you know, these fashions of Comte des Garçons came alive. Yeah. And, and so I was very happy here with the show of Walter van Berendong that the students were dressed up. Mm -hmm. um, and also, uh, a lot of people were dressed up in Walter or as a mm -hmm. homage to Walter. And um, Adele Varco and mm -hmm. her students, they came up with uh, yet another action, which was wearing a beard uh, <laughs> as a homage to Walter. But it also could have been a burqa. And I remember saying yesterday to Adele, Adele, really, this would have been impossible in Great Britain because to mm. do this with a beard looking like a burqa and a burqa looking like a beard, you might have got in real trouble. Mm. So that's an interesting thing that these, these kind of elements, mm. they are also incredibly strong uh, signs. Uh, the semiotics of fashion is incredibly important. Of course. Mm. Kat, tell us a little bit about the work that you do do at, <coughs> the, um, at the museum because I think that would be of great interest to our audience. You've been there for, um, for a while now, and you yep. mentioned in <coughs> passing working with Linda Lupa and yep. how important that is. Yep. So d describe to us the, um, the, the mission of that museum. 
Um, well, our mission is to um, explain or to, to um, present fashion, both uh, contemporary and historic, to a broad audience, um, but by um, presenting a context for fashion. We, we um, always work with extensive exhibition designs because I believe that fashion, and especially conceptual fashion, needs a context. Mm -hmm. Um, because you can explain, as a curator, you can explain everything through a caption. Um, and then you present, for example, a piece by Margiela or Comme des Garçons, and then the caption says, well, in the 80s, this was groundbreaking, this was avant-garde. And then you see people staring at it, and they see, like, the, the, the knitted um, jumper of Comme des Garçons with the, with the holes, and they say, yeah, whatever, it looks a bit sad. <laughs> um, but to explain people what avant-garde is, 20 years later is, yeah. is very hard and I don't want people to understand it through a caption. I want them to feel it. And that's the, the most important thing I learned um, from Linda is that you have to trigger people in a visual way. You have to um, surprise them. You have to shock them and mm -hmm. they have to think for themselves also. And to to because I can give them a story or a storyline or my analysis, which for a party is always a subjective analysis. But I also want them to um, make their own analysis. And I think that a lot of museums underestimate their audience a lot. And by the way, they, people do not read captions anymore. No. They <laughs> photograph them with their mobile phones. What for later? And <laughs> then they read them in the bathrooms yeah. or in the coffee <laughs> shop. I mean, Which so I think is fine. I think, oh, think we all, fine, yeah. No, we always yeah. give we, people we, we, information. We, and mm -hmm. whether they read it afterwards on the train or two mm -hmm. months later or mm -hmm. they... Or, or Three years yeah. later, that's fine, but but mm -hmm. I I feel that people because fashion is a it's a visual um, uh, discipline. It's mm -hmm. visual, so mm -hmm. and and yeah. do not forget that we are talking about you know you could say there is almost like a third and a fourth stage mm -hmm. uh, about fashion. That is that we were saying fashion is not art, but there are parallels and there is the relationships. Now there is a, a new generation I think of people who do make fashions they do make art they do make graphic design they do make music they're building networks they're building communities they travel back and forth uh, one of my favorite australian designer groups is pam perks and minis and, and they are part of a new kind of mm. movement and they fit in the museum they fit in the gallery system they fit mm. in the music system they also fit in paris in colette they have their own shop mm. now how to make an exhibition about them mm. and how to make an exhibition with them and one of the exhibitions, one of the most successful, and that's a new type of fashion exhibition, but was in mm. Frankfurt at the World Culture Museum, where mm. PIM was part of an experience where they went to the Ethnological Museum in Frankfurt. They could work for five weeks with the archive of the museum, and they could make new fashions or new mm. experiments or new images over there and show the result together with their fashions, yeah. in this case with black and mm. gold. So we have different types right now of exhibitions, which we are encountering, yeah. which include fashions. And digital is a very important yeah. one. But also, for me, more and more, film and fashion is becoming very important. Mm. Very important. Mm. The museum collects, doesn't it? You yeah. yeah. We have a collection of about 25,000 objects, um, uh, both historic and contemporary. Yeah. The historic collection is mainly 19th century. Um, um, Linda um, actually started with ac um, actively um, um, buying um, uh, pieces of the uh, contemporary designers, mainly um, Belgian designers. Mm. Um, so we have a very nice collection there. Uh, the hard thing about um, collecting fashion is, is that it's almost impossible to take a distance. And I think if you build up a collection, historic distance is important. Yeah. But I buy in the um, showrooms of designers. So uh, when a designer uh, has a catwalk show, um, two weeks after the catwalk show, he actually sells his collection in, in a showroom. Um, so I have two weeks to decide whether or not to purchase uh, a look. Of course, I can wait. But um, one year later, it's out in the world. And then I have to find a customer who wants to sell it to me. And then maybe she didn't buy the, the, the entire look or doesn't or the have right the shoes. Piece, yeah. um, so... It's it's really hard to to take a distance, and sometimes you make I think wrong wrong choices. Um, we also um, have a digital archive, and that's even more difficult because um, we used to um, collect images, press press clippings. Uh, but what you do, for example, with blogs, 
do you archive blogs? Mm. And the, the, the rhythm that, uh, uh, um, by which material is produced <coughs> is, is, is huge. And it's, 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 I think, one of the, the biggest challenges yeah, that's, uh, uh, it is. In, in building up collections. And then you have much collecting them is one thing, storing them is another yeah. thing, um, because digital archives are, are um, threatened more often than, than historic archives, because... Um, we, we, we noticed it with Walter's archive, some of the CD-ROMs of, of the 90s, we couldn't read anymore. They yeah. were lost. Mm. Right. Kat, when lost. you buy in showrooms yeah. for the museum, is there ever, ever a moment that you say, oh my God, I'm going to keep this one for myself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. No, I was, I, was, I was more thinking I'd like to go to the deaccession <laughs> sale that you might have. No, but the, the buying is really, time he's been the fun. <laughs> but the thing is that, of course, you, you, I have a personal taste, but yes. and you can never rule out 100% your personal taste, but I'm not buying what I want to wear. Uh, that's I, I, I wanted to ask Chris um, on this subject as well, because um, apparently there's a, is, is there a, a, a written clause in your contract when it comes to the Tate Modern and what you can and can't do in relation to fashion? Oh, uh, when I got hired by Tate, it's a running joke, it's still going on. My CEO, Sir Nicholas Sorota, uh, one of the first things he said to me, laughingly, but you are not going to do any of your fashion shows. <laughs> <laughs> and already a couple of months later, we were speaking <coughs> to the um, British Council, the Fashion Council, yep. uh, with uh, whom I have very good contacts, with Anna Orsini. And so we got catwalks and we do Jonathan Sanders mm -hmm. and we do, um, you know, all these people right now, they, they want mm -hmm. to work with us, which is commercial. We make it, <coughs> we make absolutely a difference yeah. between these kind of rentals, these kind of hires yes. and what we do in the museum. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are a lot of artists right now interested in the fashion system. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucy McKenzie is a very good example of an artist who works with collectives, women collectives in the north of England. And uh, she makes uh, herself these fashion items. Call it conceptual fashion, call it whatever you want, but she sells them at very democratic prices, mm. which is a very strong uh, conceptual statement. Mm. So more and more artists are moving into fashion. They, they are interested in le système de la mode, the fashion system. They are interesting, interested in the making of things. And also what uh, more and more artists are interested in is actually fabrics, is weaving, mm. and not just... Um, in terms of these things which we know, but uh, fashion, and that's another major change, has gone global. Mm. And mm. global, thanks to net porte thanks to these digital technologies, but also thanks to uh, different kinds of industries. Mm. And if we are creating a fashion museum in Melbourne, or if we continue in Antwerp or whatever, we have to take into account this global mm. thing, which is now called fashion. And that's going to change quite a lot of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Can I ask um, why you, you were told that you, you were not to do fashion at Tate Modern? It's because fashion is considered in London as part of the creative industries. Mm. And um, so a, a the creative a industries is a, is a term invented by Tony Blair and his government, by Labour, <laughs> mm -hmm. as a way to challenge Thatcher. Thatcher was, wanted to kill the arts. Uh, Tony Blair wanted to revive the arts, but for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so he, he coined the term creative industries, and that's very dangerous, that term creative industries, because creative industries is then saying, you know, this is uh, art and, and, and graphic design and, mm -hmm. and advertisement and fashion is all part of the creative industries, but doesn't allow for this kind of mm -hmm. what I call subversion. And so that's the reason why mm -hmm. I think in a museum like Tate Modern, the curators... They are very suspicious of fashion because fashion in Great Britain is seen after the underground, after punk, after Vivian Westwood as part of the creative industries, mm -hmm. as part of a kind of form of neoliberalism, which is ridiculous because fashion is incredibly important. So you're saying, you're saying a political interpretation? Oh yes, in of course, world. Walter van Berendok is also a political fashion maker. No, 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 I, don't, I'm, I, no, I mean oh. in terms yeah. of the, the, the rejection of the idea of fashion at the, right. at the Tate Modern. Yeah. Right. That's how we did the, the exhibition of Martin Margiela together at Munich when you were mm -hmm. director at Haus der Kunst. Mm -hmm. How is the context in Munich than different than the context in London because there you mm -hmm. you you I, I thought when I we first met and I presented you mm -hmm. the concept for the show I thought oh I, I will have to convince mm -hmm. him because it's an yeah. art museum and after five minutes he said I love it we do it <laughs> and I, I really that's because my so nickname is Tony you know. the producer mm. so <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> you know it's like anyway 
Uh, no, the reason why we didn't <laughs> accept that is because before I was running Tate Modern, I was director of the Haus der Kunst in Munich, mm -hmm. which uh, was a house uh, founded by the Nazis and Hitler, mm -hmm. and it was exercised. Um, mm. It was cleansed by the GIs, by the mm -hmm. American army, and immediately in 1946-47, there were fashion shows in Munich because they showed to you know the woman in Munich what was going on in America on the mm -hmm. East Coast, what was going on in Paris, and it was showing them th this kind of op optimism of mm. a, a liberalized Europe. And that's the reason why it's perfectly normal, and it was perfectly normal, to show in the Haus der Kunst also fashion. Again, fashion is a very political thing. Mm. If you look at the show of Walter van Berendonck, I'm using the, the term biological, biological politics, it is very much political what he's doing. It's the politics of the body. I mean, the expressions of Walter van Berendonck, what he says about gender yes, and yeah. identity and about sexuality and about homosexuality and also about youth cult culture is a very strong statement. And that's to be taken very seriously. It's not something um, frivolous. It's not something just beautiful. It's, um, you know, it's the danger of beauty because beauty mm. can be really dangerous and very effective and can say something which we don't know yet. We feel it. And when a statement like that is worn on a body, it becomes even more effective. I saw yesterday night people who were dressed up in Walter, with Walter, and of course it's beautiful, it's affective, but I also saw some people who were looking at that, not with mistrust, but a kind of, ooh, what was going mm. on there? And the same with, uh, I would say, with some lines, which I consider very important today, like Rick Owens. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a kind of threat which is coming mm. out, which I think is very, yeah, think very important. I think fashion is a, is a, um, a very powerful tool in, in, mm -hmm. in today's um, society. If you look at advertising, if you look at mm -hmm. the, the, the power of the fashion image mm -hmm. in, in, in our contemporary society, mm -hmm. I, I, I think it... it, it um, is even more powerful um, mm. than uh, how art communicates to a broad audience. Absolutely. No, it's true, and, and, and particularly even mm. with something as simple uh, as the T-shirt, you know, where, yeah, but also where, the, where, the, where the political yeah, but message and also yeah. the, the, yeah. the uh, yeah. advertising yeah. message yeah. has merged yeah. with the T-shirt. But that over has seven to do years. also with fashion and the fashion item as the fetish. Mm. Look at your shoes. They're fetish shoes. I mean, they're fetish shoes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think they are fantastic, but they are not adorable. They're okay. not adorable. <laughs> they are marvelous. I adore but them. They are Be not careful with what <laughs> you <are> say, Chris. <laughs> These are a women's <laughs> shoes. Show your shoes. Do you see Virginia's shoes? The shoes are seen. Don't they worry. are. They, they are marvelous, <laughs> but not adorable. <laughs> they are. Yeah, but uh, I have a spike that I can They are amazing, to but it. not genteel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it's this is a fetish. Yes. And and mm -hmm. I'm. You got a problem run. with that? No, no. I'm <laughs> just I'm just looking around. <laughs> um, we've traversed. Um, fashion as being art or, or not art, and you've mentioned industrial design as well. I think we should talk about fashion and craft mm -hmm. as well, because there's a there's a very important history and relationship there, and well, not only relationship, but I would venture that the the only fashion works that would ever turn up, that would ever make it into your museum, or maybe even in time into the Tate Modern, are works that have at their heart an exceptionally fine or challenging or interesting connection mm -hmm. to craft. Yeah, that can be one of the reasons why you why you collect a, a, a garment or an object is the craft or or, or the technology um, through which uh, an item is made, and also here I think there are very exciting things going on. If you think uh, um, about three D printing, yeah. what's going on there, and 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 fashion discovered three D printing. There's this Dutch designer Iris van Herpen who does um, wonderful stuff um, with with a Belgian company called uh, Materialized. Um, and the interesting thing is that these technologies were um, not in the first place used for, for fashion or art or architecture, but in the, in the medical business and in the auto, um, the car industry. Um, that's where these companies made their, made their money. And then, um, you know, the, the art and architecture is a bit spielerei for, for them. Um, but I think that's amazing. And these new technologies, I really believe that they will change the whole design process because as a fashion designer if you if you're not a good pattern maker you need a pattern maker because designing is has always been teamwork mm. um, but when you design a 3d dress you need um, um, an algorithm 
you need a, a 3D file and you need a, um, a very good 3D designer mm. besides you. And I think the input of designer and 3D designer are will be equal. And that that um, asks for a change um, in, in, in how fashion designers think about their role in the creative process. Uh, I think we will have a big evolution mm. there as well. It will become something like conceptual art, like you buy you buy a certificate, you buy an instruction. Yeah, yeah but you buy an algorithm. That would be very interesting. I yeah. buy an, a certificate mm. by Walter van Berendonk, which is a file, and I put it in. Yeah. And you know what? There is somebody here, I think, who is a pioneer of that already, and he's sitting next to Walter van Berendonk. He's, he's another of the Antwerp Six, and that's Dirk mm. van Sane. When we bought for the yeah. Museum Boymans, Dirk, in 1989 or 98, when we bought your paper dresses... We knew, of course, that this is a problem for durability. Now, in a museum, yeah. we can keep paper dresses, but I can imagine that the continuation or the consequence of that is that, you know, next, what we do buy is a certificate by Dirk van Sane with a file, and we create another paper dress. Mm -hmm. So all these things are becoming very interesting. So yeah. well-made in fashion mm -hmm. will not anymore be just a matter of durability, of sustainability. It's something else. Well-made will be, mm. it's, it's easy to copy. So then I don't have a problem anymore with my trousers, which I bought in 83 of Comme des Garçons. I don't have to go from tailor to tailor to mm. try to remake them, but I just can start to copy mm. it. And the first thing I would do is when I buy something, before it went three, ten times to the dry cleaner, I would, you know, copy mm. it and then I can but print it out. It could be the mm. ultimate democratization of, of fashion, but I say it could be because we're mm. not could there. Be, could we're be, not yeah. there yeah. yet. Mm. Um, I think yeah. the ultimate democratization mm. of, of beauty and fashion mm. is to work directly with and on the body. And that's how I start yeah. to see plastic <coughs> surgery right now. And I'm not talking they, about, yeah. you know, the whatever. I'm, I'm talking about something else where you really but they start can, they to... They can print skin. Yeah. There's they Dutch can print skin. There's a yeah. Dutch company mm -hmm. that prints skin. Right. They use it now mm -hmm. for people with right. um, burn, burn mm -hmm. wounds. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because the next, uh, in what I've been reading in, 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 in serious newspapers, also from um, by psychoanalysts, is this, that the female body, the fetish of the female body, of the fetishization of the female body is constantly changing. And I keep hearing, and this is really serious, what I'm trying to say, that it's changing now to the upper arms and the mm -hmm. underarms, and that's becoming a very important <coughs> thing. So people now are starting to spend time in trying to stretch this and, and making uh, there are certain mm -hmm. exercises to make sure that these arms keep looking good. So that's the next thing. So people start to laugh already. It's amazing. <coughs> I mean, you know, that's a funny thing. When mm. you talk in a serious way about fashion, mm -hmm. immediately people start to laugh. And mm. it has to do with... Uh, by the way, that's okay. It has to do, <laughs> it has to do I think, with a kind of... Yeah. That's true. With, <laughs> with a kind of gêne. With, oh, yeah, with people uh, feel... Yeah, shame is, for me, one of mm. the most fascinating things of the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. It's Absolutely. Subject for an exhibition. It's I a think, subject shame, for an yeah. exhibition. Shame. Mm. Let's do that, Kat. Yeah. Shame. At Tate. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Uh, we don't call it a fashion <laughs> exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> we've got some images that um, I know we're going to, oh, yeah. to look at and then oh, talk really? through. Okay. Yeah, we forgot the let's, well, let's do yeah. that in, in a moment. But I, but I just wanted to uh, pause for a moment because you touched on this, mm. both of you have tangentially, which is the challenges of, of working with a living designer. Mm -hmm. um, against what you might sort of pull out of the archives and yeah. with, uh, designers who aren't around anymore. Um, what are the particular challenges there? And I should imagine there'd be a, 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 it'd be a very fruitful one as well that would yeah. that would end up with with uh, works and and complexities that you pe perhaps didn't envisage in the first place. Yeah, no, we always insist when it's possible when the designer is still alive to collaborate with the designer and his team, his creative team. Um, because it's it's I can make an analysis of 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 uh, the work of a designer, or I can um, explain the historic uh, importance of of the oeuvre of of a fashion designer. But if I can't recreate the creative world of 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 a fashion designer, and and that's why we we bring these people in to to actually co-curate. For me, curating is also a teamwork. It's not me who does makes the object list and 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 decides on everything. Um, but the hard thing is, is to find the balance, to find the balance where my input starts and 
um, my input ends and how how you collaborate and sometimes designers allow you mm. into their world and allow your interpretation uh, some designers find it really hard if you interpret the, their work. Um, uh, a lot of designers say, yeah, but <coughs> I never intended it that way. This was never my inspiration source. But of course, when you bring fashion out in the world, it, it gets its own life and yeah. it can get meanings, layers, different layers of meanings that were never intentional. Yes. Um, so, uh, but these are very interesting and fruitful discussions and, and often... Uh, very difficult uh, discussions, um, but I, I keep on insisting mm. on, on doing this because I know there are a lot of museums that say, oh, you, do you collaborate with designers? We think they're you know, very difficult and we like to keep mm. them away and they're, they're, we, we want them you know, on the opening night, but don't <laughs> allow them in the museum. Um, and, and don't forget that mm. a lot of fashion designers, they are very interested in making exhibitions as a form together with their f investors or finance people as a form of public relations. I yep. mean, I remember doing some fashion shows where my biggest problem was not the designer, but the marketeers of the firm yeah. and yeah. the lawyers and the yeah. accountants and yeah. all the people related to it because they wanted a return on their investment yeah. because, yeah. of course, fashion is consumption. Yeah. Right, yeah. and the second thing is that the designer and these people are always interested in to show the newest of the new. Yeah. And, and that's also, yeah, an, yeah. An, I mean, it, it, these are paradoxes, difficulties, which makes yeah. the, the making of fashion uh, very, very exciting. And mm. you have to be very alert because displaying fashion is a craft. It's an absolutely crucial thing to think every exhibition of fashion completely anew. Mm. And I'm starting to think now that one of the most exciting things would be to start to study how people move in fashion exhibitions, mm. how uh, kinesthetically. Mm. Because what we always uh, tend to make are fashion exhibitions when you go <coughs> from one to the next. And there is nothing more boring than to see people who move from mm. one to the next. And because in a museum, it's fan fantastic because you can watch people watching. So I think we should start to work, for instance, with choreographers, because I think yeah. fashion shows should be just as exciting as the catwalks. The catwalks yeah. are the theater of today. The seating, the way it works, I mean, you know, high, low, the way the models walk. Yeah. Uh, it's fascinating, and we should try to make exhibitions yeah. which are clear, precise, and as exciting yeah. as the catwalk, yeah. and whereby the role of the audience is really like something which we have to consider and reconsider. Wow. And I'm sure that uh, Kat is going to do that. <laughs> well, if, I, if only your curated objects were allowed to be worn by bodies, which you mentioned at the top of our discussion, and which is, well, to me, always such a, such a big problem, such a big issue, as you say. They're meant yeah. to be on the body. I go to a but museum, actually, I see them, and I think, you we poor things locked away in cupboards yeah. for the rest of your <laughs> lives. <laughs> but we actually did it once with, uh, when we did um, uh, an exhibition with Yoji Yamamoto, mm. the Japanese designer. Um, when, of course, when we work with our own archive um, for conservation um, rules, it's not allowed that people yep. wear the garments. But when you work with the archive of a fashion designer, you know, designers have often great archives, but they, they use it as a working tool. They, they, they archive with, um, for completely different reasons than, than museums. <coughs> so if the designer himself insists that people touch the garments or wear the garments, then that's fine, uh, fine for me. So when we did the exhibition with Yamamoto, he said, I really want people to wear the garments. First problem you have is that, okay, you can make a selection of garments, but you know that your um, um, visitors um, don't have like um, size... Um, all, all of them have size 38. I don't know what's here in Australia. Yeah, so we're not a real shop. The exhibition was called Dream Shop. So we're not, we were not a real shop. <coughs> the, the good thing with the, the fashion of Yamamoto is that he works a lot with oversized garments mm. and that the, the importance of the element of air between the body and the garment, the air transforms the garment and that you can only experience through um, trying the garment on. So um, women with different body types, uh, tall women, um, short women, could wear the same dress. And mm -hmm. that was really a wonderful thing. I, I would never do it with a different mm -hmm. designer because you don't want to frustrate your audience mm -hmm. by giving them yeah. a size that's too <laughs> too small. Um, but with Yamamoto, it worked perfectly. We had these, um, at the center of the uh, exhibition, there were like fitting um, cabins. 
and we really insisted that there was um, staff from the museum um, explaining the garments to people because um, we also realized that the biggest part of our audience was not familiar with, with a con conceptual fashion. Mm. And it's not about dressing up. We didn't want people to, to try on a dress and then start laughing and, you know, they, they should take it seriously. Shame. And it really, mm -hmm. it really, <laughs> it really worked. The, um, the theme is developing. I, I, have to <laughs> I have to tell just an anecdote about uh -huh. Yoshi Yamamoto because there are many different ways to approach uh -huh. a person like Yoshi Yamamoto. There is an amazing film, which you probably can buy at Tony's shop, which is a DVD on DVD, which is a film by Wim Wenders mm -hmm. about Yoshi yes. Yamamoto. And I think that that film is one of the perfect ways of showing the mm. work of Yoshi Yamamoto. Another way to do it mm. is uh, to go and shop for yourself and not buying Yamamoto, but buying his sources. Because, mm. you know, when I started to be interested in, in fashion, I didn't have money because it was already very mm. expensive. And then I heard through uh, Yoshi that his source are the clothes, the raincoats of Buddhist monks. So I was in Kyoto, working <coughs> in Kyoto on a film about Japanese women and feminism, whatever. And I went to that Buddhist monk shop and I bought my Yoshi Yamamoto without the label of Yoshi <laughs> for $50 <laughs> instead of $5,000, let's say. And I still have the, all that stuff. And I regularly go to Kyoto to a Buddhist monk shop. It's an outlet for Buddhist monks. <laughs> and I always say that I'm a Buddhist monk living in Belgium. So I get to buy <laughs> I get to buy everything from Yoshi Yamamoto for nothing, which is great. I love that they try and check a card at the door when you do that. Um, mm. Let's try and get some of those images up um, if we can. Yeah. And of course, the exhibition yeah, that we have here. exhibition in Antwerp. And you see, it's a comp you know, space and architecture is so important mm. when you curate. You see the, 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 the exhibition is completely different in Antwerp, and I was so happy seeing it here in, in Melbourne. Um, I think the, the, the space in Melbourne is, is uh, powerful because of its height, and, and it's a space, I think, that very easily overpowers the objects you put on display. And I think the design, which Walter did together with Heert, who is there, works really amazingly um, well in the space. But when I see this, I think one of one of the things, one of the real challenges right now is that I think we should really try to make all our shops uh, mm. in the high street look like this kind of exhibition. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's so boring mm -hmm. to see these fas fantastic items in these incredibly boring mm -hmm. architectural environments. So this would be something which we have to teach ourselves that we have mm -hmm. to change our shops. But we don't have to teach Walter. He has <laughs> one of the most exciting shops. That's true. In Walter Antwerp, had a fantastic uh, shop with Mark Newsom, by the way, yeah. the yeah. Australian also, designer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a this is a collaboration mm. with uh, Volker de Jong, um, who's a Dutch uh, uh, Dutch artist. Yeah, and we loaned a piece of Volker um, for the exhibition in Antwerp, and it was I, th I think mm. through the exhibition that you came in in, in touch with uh, Volker, and that ended in a collaboration between the two of them. Uh, with these fantastic top hats. This is one of the latest collections called um, Shut Your Eyes to See. And Walter just yesterday I think, told me that and that's it's it. all about, uh, it's a very intimate collection. Shut your eyes to see. If you close your eyes, you look into yourself. This is it's for me one of the most exciting things because this, this, these yeah. lips is, of course, something which reminds us of, of Salvador Walter. Dali. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And here you have a very good example of the fetish. Huh? Mm -hmm. Which is fascinating. This is wonderful. Walter van Bernock is also somebody who tried to reinvent what the meaning can be uh, of the accessoire. And we are still ashamed, mm. uh, you know, to wearing accessoires. I mean, the brick bag mm. we, we accept, but uh, when, and rings, mm. of course, but even colors and, mm. and hats. But that's I why, mean, it's that's something why Walter we are still is so fascinated about. by Papua New Guinea because there. Um, Decu the body decoration is not the privilege of, mm -hmm. of women alone, but mm -hmm. also of, of men. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the ultimate democratization of beauty. <laughs> <laughs> you can work directly on the skin. Oh, I thought you meant that anyone could be a lizard. No, but I mean, I, I think this is absolutely <laughs> beautiful. When we did a show with Walter van Berendonk in Museum Boymans van Beuningen, he uh, <coughs> carried out together with the body artist these prostheses on the body, so he worked on the face, and it was really fantastic, uh, directly on mm. the body. And this is a very good example. But right? that also references... Yeah, th that's, doesn't what well the that's what what also a lot of, of, of um, um, uh, tribes do. Eh? Exactly, I was about so to say. It references your very deep interest in that. Yeah. As a second skin. That's right. 
as as a way of of sort of warding off evil spirits. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of a second skin mm. is also very important mm. in Walter's work. That can be sort of body mm. decoration, that can be a mask, mm. a mask as, as an alternative to makeup. Mm -hmm. We're here talking about Dream the World Awake, but also about Hollywood costume, um, which is, of course, the exhibition here at Acme, which I know that you've seen, Chris. Yes, and of course I've seen it's, it. It's, it's intriguing to me mm -hmm. that um, we know that, that theatre and cinema, and theatre in particular, mm -hmm. is you know, a great deal of, of smoke and mirrors. It has to be by necessity. It's creating an illusion. Mm -hmm. So even though you, know, you might have theatre flats that evoke a, um, a particular place and time, they're not real, and they're just, they're just mm -hmm. painted cheap plywood. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to these costumes, these are completely real. The, the sort of care uh, and expertise that you would expect from a piece of couture has been applied to these, even mm. though it's, it's to be filmed and to be filmed from some mm. distance away. I find that, that, that paradoxical and intriguing too. It has nothing anymore to do with fashion. Mm. It's all about semiotics. It's all about sign language. Mm. Uh, costumes and the colour of costumes and the form in the cinema is adding to the meaning of not just the scene, but, mm. you know, the meaning yeah. of that very image. The man in the white hat, the and man in so the black hat. And so I would say <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it doesn't say anything about fashion. It says everything about um, expressing something and it yeah. adds to the expression. For instance, in, in, in horror movies, um, red shoes, you know that something is going to happen. Mm. Uh, mm. What's the name <coughs> of the film anymore? The Ketting, the, the Chain Massacre? The Chainsaw Texas, Massacre. Texas oh, Chainsaw Massacre. a beautiful Massacre. film with mm. so many red shoes. I mean, mm -hmm. I love that, and I knew it was going to explode. It was mm -hmm. going to splash on the mm. screen. So there are many examples. Hitchcock is a mm. very good example. You know the cut and the yeah. silhouette of the dress and the way she turns to the left and the dress just moves up a little. You know something is going to happen. Mm. And uh, for me, it's the same as doorknobs in cinema, as windows. It's, it's, yeah, it's the semiotics of cinema. Yeah. And the way this exhibition has been put up is fascinating because mm. it, it's not about fashion. It's not about the fashions of Hollywood. It's about the signage, the strong mm. signage of Hollywood, which I think is marvelous. And suddenly you start to understand what, what's going on there. Mm. So that's, that's something completely different. And we should not underestimate um, the costumes for the development of the Hollywood drama. To give you one example, I'm a complete addict of the Western genre. And the Western genre with the white cowboy, I'm talking about the early films, the white cowboy and the black cowboy. And then when you look at the preacher of Clint Eastwood, the way Clint with his big leather jacket, proto, avant la lettre Rick Owens. I mean, uh, Rick Owens must got it from the preacher hmm. of uh, Clint Eastwood. It's fantastic how he sits on his horse with this long leather God, and you know something is going to happen. He's going to save the world. Mm. Mm. And I love this kind of indications. <laughs> and at that point, we have run out of time, so please thank our guest this evening, will you? Chris Derkin and Kat Debo. Thank you.